Thank you so much for joining D. Jenny from the blockchain. And I have one more question. <laughs> That's the coolest name for a, for a podcast I've ever heard. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> We're going to be enhancing enhancing Para to enhance it with the ability to to be able to spend either your your, your stable coins like USDC, which we have on Algorand natively, or indeed Algo itself. We have a team of people that are engaged with all of the major exchanges, all of the major platforms out there talking to the various apps and other chains, explaining to them how their app can sing on, on Algorand the way it does not on other chains. We're going to be launching a peer-to-peer -peer, um, in 2024. It's coming very soon. It's going to make the network fantastically decentralized. We're going to start incentivizing or paying for the execution of consensus. And we've got a white paper we're going to release soon. No one was was doing pure Python as the primary language. And so that's what AlgoKit is. That's what we're doing, bringing Python as the developer tool. Glenn Lambo, I'm such a degen. Welcome to D Jenny from the blockchain where we defy logic. And in this episode, we have an awesome show lined up for you. Algorand Foundation Chief Technical Officer John Woods joins the show. We talk about the scalability of Algorand and how Algorand is becoming more decentralized, as well as the 2024 outlook, including Python development on the chain and the possibility of using Algo to pay for things in real life at stores. I love that idea. Uh, I want to mention that this is not a sponsored video at all. I simply wanted to understand the tech of Algorand better. So I reached out to John and he was nice enough to carve out some time for me. And now I can share with you what I learned. Enjoy the show. We're here with John Woods, the chief technical officer of Algorand Foundation. And we always wonder what the tech is of Algorand. You know, people always say it has great tech. So there's no better person to answer that than John Woods. So. John, um, can you briefly expa explain the tech of Algorand? Sure. So Algorand and other layer one blockchains like Algorand have taken this approach to designing software that starts in open source. So all of the code for Algorand uh, is open source code that anyone is free to, to look at and manipulate and to change. And so this code, like any normal computer program, gets compiled down to an executable or an app, same as the app that you run on your, on your phones, same as apps that you run on your desktop computer like Microsoft Word. The difference is, though, that Algorand, when it's running, isn't just running on one computer. It's running on thousands of computers all over the world. And this forms a network, a network of computers that are connected, that are um, ensuring the veracity and correctness of a distributed ledger or blockchain. And so why is this interesting? Um, it's interesting because we can write computer programs for this Algorand operating system, because that's really what it is. It's like a decentralized operating system that can run code itself. And so we can write apps for this software-based operating system. And you might think, well, what's the advantage of writing apps for Algorand or Ethereum or any other layer one blockchain and running them in this decentralized network rather than just running them on your phone or your computer right in front of you? And the answer is, there are certain classes of, of application um, where the application itself will greatly benefit from executing or running in a decentralized context. Because sometimes applications, we don't have to trust them, right? If you're watching Netflix locally, I think you'll know if the, if the movie goes off the rails or if there's a problem with the application, you'll notice pretty fast if there's issues with the sound or whatever. But when you're running app financial applications, it can be really beneficial to run them in a context where there's many participants ensuring the correctness of the execution of the application. And indeed, there's many participants in this in this distributed, like, you know, swarm of, of computers that are ensuring that uh, no one on the network misbehaves. And so that's the value of building um, on decentralized operating systems like Algorand. And the apps that tend to benefit the most at a high level are, of course, financial ones. But other than that, the apps that disintermediate, sorry, that disintermediate, so apps that remove the middleman, um, where you want to remove Ticketmaster, where you want to sell a ticket peer to peer, where you want to be able to resell a plane ticket, where you want to be able to tokenize an asset like a house and sell it to someone without uh, necessarily knowing them. Um, apps that benefit from uh, provenance and veracity tracking. So the idea that, you know, you might have some very expensive shoes or a handbag or some other luxury good, or maybe it's not goods like that. Maybe it's coffee or it's uh, medicines. But things that are, it's really important not to be counterfeit, okay? So again, you know, we're looking and we're seeing 
a, a trend here. It's like trust, where you need to have a root of trust. And then finally, um, I think another area that's really, really powerful in, in running on blockchain is decentralized identity. This idea that you emancipate your identity away from a provider who attests to your identity like, ne like a government or an agency or a, you know, a club. And instead, your identity is owned by yourself. Uh, it's owned by yourself because you're the one in control of it on the blockchain. You're the one who um, ultimately has the right to, to use it and, and it is controlled by you. And so these are exciting areas. And so Algorand is a layer one blockchain that um, is out there competing with other chains like Cardano and Ethereum um, to be a, a market leader in decentralized operating systems and to build a fairer, a more egalitarian, um, and I think more inclusive uh, world of, or network of value um, and, and digital, digital finance system. Wow, I, I love what you said there. And um, there seems like there's plenty of use cases on the Algorand blockchain, as you mentioned, with ticketing or um, real estate. I, I have seen projects like TravelX and a couple other um, things on, on X posts uh, of, you know, Algorand being used in that way. So, and you mentioned decentralization, of course, that's one of the um, pillars of the trilemma that people often talk about in crypto, the other being security and scalability. So, um, we also hear a lot of people say that Algorand has solved this trilemma. So we got decentralization. Can you talk about how Algorand can scale and be secure? This kind of trope or, or this kind of notion of a trilemma is not my favorite thing. Um, I understand why it was put out there, but I'm not a big fan of it because, I don't know, it's a little bit restrictive if, in terms of thinking about the architecture of these networks. And so, um, yes, Algorand is decentralized in the sense that it is a novel proof of consensus Oh, sorry, consensus mechanism called pure proof of stake. And so this pure proof of stake consensus mechanism um, allows us to, in a very elegant, mathematically, um, I guess, uh, well, without heavy computation, okay, so mathematically uh, efficient way, it allows us to have participants in the network that hold our the ALGO token, which is the native currency or native uh, token of the Algorand uh, blockchain. Anyone who's in possession of this Algorand token may participate in the um, execution of the consensus mechanism. So they can be part of the club that's verifying the transactions, that's verifying the activities, that's verifying the execution of code on the blockchain. And so all they need is Algo, and then they're welcome to participate uh, like anyone else is. It's completely open and permissionless. And so the amount of Algo you have determines how much of a, of a say you have in the consensus operation. And we call that this is known as proof of stake, but Algorand goes one step further with this with this with this novel pure proof of stake. And so this pure proof of stake approach to consensus is one that um, really empowers the individual. And so a lot of other proof of stake networks will pool stake together. And so you'll have these staking pools or delegated staking, and you will allow someone to stake on your behalf. And this is kind of a common thing. Um, by the way, this is contrasted, of course, with proof of work that's used by Bitcoin and, and others. But Algorand's proof of stake is not like this. It doesn't. We don't want people to pool together. We really want um, to have this pure, egalitarian, decentralized um, network. And so the way we do that is by having a consensus mechanism, which is which not only empowers the individual, but uh, incentivizes the individual to participate with their home computer. And so Algorand's consensus mechanism can run on, on any regular home computer. Um, and with a single algo, you can be up and supporting the network and participating in security. And so that's how um, we have decentralized the network. Um, in terms of securing the network, um, Algorand's uh, consensus mechanism, which again is the, the heart of keeping everyone in check, right? It's, it's the, the rules of the game. And so you want to make sure that um, the consensus mechanism is set up in a way that uh, no one can can uh, cheat or take shortcuts, right? Um, and so mathematically, we can prove um, that if a certain percentage of the stake is being honest and using this Byzantine fault tolerant kind of concept, um, we can prove correctness of, 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 the, of the system. And so we can say, well, if everyone is running the consensus mechanism that we proposed and it's operating according to the specification and we have enough participants um, where, you know, 
uh, a certain supermajority of the stake is is honest, of course, and you need that for any network. If if everyone in the network is dishonest, then the network doesn't work whatsoever. And, and in Bitcoin, that's like you know you need at least fifty one percent of the of the the proof of work uh, hash rate to be to be honest. In Algorand, uh, the bar is a little bit higher, um, but the once a certain portion of of the, of the network is being honest, um, we can ensure the correctness of, of of the execution of the network and then finally with regard um to scalability algorand is i think best in class in, in terms of scalability so or certainly I, I don't like to be too you know hyperbolic about things and and too like oh we're the best we're the greenest we're the fastest or whatever because i think everyone says that i, I don't think it sounds disingenuous i think i think it sounds disingenuous and it's not very authentic but I think objectively, if you look at Algorand and you compare it to its peers, and its peers are, you know, Cardano, Ethereum, uh, AVAX, Solana, etc., it measures up pretty well. And so Algorand uses um, about 80 kilowatts uh, of instantaneous power, which is, uh, I like to say, like a Tesla charging, because a Tesla at a, at a supercharger will use about 150 kilowatts at home, it'll use about 20. Um, and so when you're out in the street, it's somewhere like 60, 70, 80. So, you know, about a Tesla that's charging. So for the entire network, which is really quite efficient. And so that, that scales quite well. And as we add more transactions, that, uh, it, it's, you know, sublinear. So you, you don't need, you know, you don't need, if you add double the transaction count, you don't need 160 kilowatts. It's happy humming away at, at 80 kilowatts. Um, sufficiently decentralized at 80 kilowatts. Um, in terms of transactions per second, uh, which is important. It's, it's something I think it's a bit like guys in the gym saying how much they can lift, but like, it is important that the network has a certain threshold with which it's able to operate. Otherwise, it's not really fit for international or global uh, applications, which is what we're pitching these blockchains uh, for, right? We're like, change the world of finance. And so you've got to be able to service the world in that case. And so Algorand kind of runs at about about 10,000 transactions a second. Now, this can go up and down a little bit, depending on whether you're calling contracts or sending funds or blah, 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 blah. But um, <clears throat> that puts it very competitive. If you look at Visa, Visa on a normal day will be doing 7,000 TPS or so. Or now it can ramp up to about 50, but you got Algorand, you know, uh, punching way above its weight, certainly for the amount of energy that it's using. Um, and then finally, I would just touch on the on, on some concepts around blockchain. You know, you've got blocks in this blockchain. The blocks, what, what are they? Well, they are um, blocks of data that hold transactions, right? And we call them blocks. I mean, really, if you look inside them, it's just binary data, but it's it's computer data that is linked together. So you've got a blob of computer data, it's got so many transactions inside it, you can think of it like a document, and then it's got a cryptographic link to the next blob, and cryptographic link to the next blog. And most blockchains, they do this thing where they have this probabilistic finality. So I'm, and there's, I'm using a lot of kind of words here that are maybe people who are not software engineers or who, who are not working in finance may not know. But the idea is, how do I know when I do a trend, when I perform a transaction using my blockchain, how do I know that it's confirmed? It's good. It's not going away. It's absolutely solid. And so you need this, right? And people will know when you tap your Visa card in a store, you kind of hang out a little bit waiting for the little kind of, I think, you know, it's cleared, right? And so the store expects you to hang out there. You, you don't get to leave with the diamond earrings until they see the little the, the transaction go through. And so it's the same with blockchain. You got to wait for the transaction to go through. And so how long does it usually take? Well, on older blockchains or well, I suppose all blockchains are updated all the time because it's software, but on blockchains that have an older architecture, like Bitcoin as an example, which is revolutionary, but of course now is an older architecture, um, you're looking at about 40 minutes before you're, you're, you're good to walk out of the store. And of course, that's fine if I want to transfer you $10 million. It's not fine if I want to buy a coffee. Algorand has a 3.3 second block time, which means there's a new block every 3.3 seconds. So let's say about three seconds, every three seconds is a block. And once your transaction is in a block, which happens right away, you're final on Algorand. And that's a mathematical property of this of the, of the consensus using uh, cryptographic primitives, such as the verifiable random functions that our founder Silvio invented. Um, but ultimately, you know, the key message here is that Algorand is secure, it's decentralized, and it scales well with 10,000 TPS with a finality that's instant. At the second your transaction is in a block, you don't have to wait for it to be compounded into the sand it's just straight away it's confirmed and this lets algorand scale particularly well for enterprise apps but but for apps in general well from my experience when i buy algorand on coinbase 
and I move it over to my para wallet, it's there before I even can open up my para wallet and check if it's there. You know what I'm saying? It's it's that fast, and the fee is 0. 0.002 algo, so that's super cheap, of course. So yes, I I can attest to this. Like Algorand is super fast and uh, and cheap. Um, so just for that alone, it's great. Um, regardless of all the other things that you mentioned, which is also incredible. And you said that everybody can um, can stake and using their home computer. So obviously there's no big mining rigs because it's not a proof of work and there's no pools like you said. But you mentioned um, earlier this year something about a one-click staking um, sort of uh, mechanism for Algorand. Is there an update on that? Yeah, sure. So. So the reason I think this is important is because not everyone is a geek. Not everyone wants to muck around with their computer at a low level or in a terminal or a command line where you're typing commands and hitting enter. People, they've moved beyond that and computing has moved beyond that. And we should, we should build these things for humans, not for engineers. Or it's never going to be adopted. And by the way, that's why I'm so staunchly focused on AlgoKit, which is our developer tools, because even the tools that we're building for, for nerds and geeks and engineers like me to build apps, those tools need to be easy to use. We need to make it easy even for the engineering people who are building the apps themselves. But we need to make it especially easy for the normal user who is not an engineer, both in terms of interacting with, with the applications on the chain so that it's as fun and easy as your phone, but also, also in, in terms of participating because one of the virtues of this whole blockchain thing is that it's not just run by your bank. It's not just run by Lloyd's or City or, or State Street or whatever. Instead, it's run by everyone. And so we should empower people, in my view, and in the view, of course, of, 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 of all the folks working on Algorand, we should empower people to be part of that. And so this means making the process easier. So yeah, sure. If you're super savvy, you go, I mean, the, the technical route is you go to the Algorand GitHub code repository, pull the code, compile it, generate your participation keys, fire up those cryptographic keys in, in a computer and, and then walk away. Who's going to be able to do that? No one, right? I'd find it hard to do. So um, the idea around this one-click node was make it so that people can like click a button or, you know, uh, like double-clicking Microsoft Word and it just brings up everything they need, guides them through this thing in a very obvious and clear way that they know what they're doing at every step and then allow them to ultimately participate in this consensus in the security of the network simply by dedicating a little bit of their computer's time so you know it's not spinning up the fans it's just like running in the background and everything's cool and can you do that through para wallet where how do you do that so right now you can't do it through para wallet you have to use um either the foundation's uh one click node solution or the community by the way there's a number of people who were inspired by what we did um well the, the idea of what we were trying to do and have put the i think even better versions out and i love this by the way because Ultimately, the foundation, the Inc. Yes, we are the figureheads in, in, of the project, but you know, the f where's the, the future of Algorand is not the foundation of the Inc. The future of Algorand is a community-owned and, and 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 open source project like Linux or Blender or anything else. It's not for people, you know, to be run by companies. I don't think certainly not in in, in the longer term. You know, in, in ten years, fifteen years, it's got to be owned and run and, and built by the community. I think. Um, and so, yeah, you know, um, I think we're trying to do a lot at the foundation. So we're doing everything from our, the, on the tech side anyway, we're doing dev, dev relations, we're doing algo kit, um, we're running infrastructure. Um, we are building and helping building products like Para now. Um, we're doing some professional services like getting World Chess back online, et cetera. And so we're doing a lot of stuff and we only have a small team, right? It's tens of people. It's not like hundreds of people. And so our one click node solution is not as good as some of the great things I've seen from the community. Um, because it still requires a little bit of, of, of tweaking. Um, but we're going to be releasing a second version of it soon. That's going to be even better. But ultimately, the ethos of building building software that people can use and, and making it so that everyone can take part and all they need is a computer and some basic computer literacy, that is where we need to take these networks if, it's, if they're truly decentralized, right? Right. Um and I want to get to AlgoKit in a minute and how Python has been integrated in it because that's a game changer right there. But right before we get to that, I just want to uh, finish up on the um, true instant finality. So at Token 2049, you mentioned that Algorand has true instant finality and you briefly um, went through what that means. Once a transaction is in a block, it is completely final. 
on many other chains, including great projects such as Ethereum and Cardano, you will have sometimes short rollbacks, block height battles, where a, a, ch a chain that has been deployed to the, to, the, to the network and has been accepted as valid is rolled back and replaced with a, long, with a longer chain or indeed a different chain. And so this happens all the time. These block height battles uh, occur. These chain rollbacks occur all the time. And what usually happens in an enterprise context where you have a mission critical application is that you have to watch for these rollbacks and replay your transactions. Now, that brings a ton of middleware into your, into your application. Within Algorand, because of the VRF primitive, the consensus algorithm, consensus is reached by 100% of the network on every block. And so this means as soon as a transaction is in a block, which occurs every 3.3 seconds, your transaction is completely final. How is it that Algorand can solve that, but other popular chains can't? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and by the way, I, I should, we should also talk about the consensus incentives idea because it's a very important philosophical and technical change that's coming up, and I think it's it's worth it's worth talking about because it, 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 you know, all this stuff dovetails together. Running a node, securing the network, staking your algo. Do you get paid for that? Well, you do on Bitcoin, you do on Cardano, you don't right now on Algorand, but you will soon. And, I, and that's very important. Uh, philosophical, financial, economic, and technical change that's coming to the network that we're excited about because ultimately it's going to mean more people, more nodes, uh, more security. The mathematical primitive and the cryptographic primitive, the Lego brick that Algorand uses to achieve its consensus mechanism, which ultimately empowers and enables this idea of instant finality, that primitive, that Lego brick, is used by other blockchains. Cardano uses it. Um, so it's called a VRF. It's uh, technically, it's an asymmetric HMAC function. Um, but what it really is, is to people out there who are not uh, cryptographic engineers, it's kind of like a, a slot machine in a casino. You pull this lever, you put in, uh, you know, uh, some, some random noise on one side, and out comes um, an output, which can be, which is deterministic but probabilistic, i.e. you can't predict what it's going to be next, but you can verify that it was correct based on the noise that you put in. And that might sound like a very basic thing, like how can you build something, you know, you're okay, you put noise in, you get random out, you can verify it's random. Mm, how useful is that? Turns out very useful. Turns out we can build, um, we can use that as a linchpin or a, a fundamental uh, building block and build distributed systems uh, and it empowers all sorts of cool things like cryptographic sortition and, and consensus engineering, sorry, cons consensus mechanism and other things. So Cardano uses this. They they took the, the VRF primitive that is open source and they're very much entitled to take. Um, and they built um, they built their consensus mechanism using this. And so on Cardano's side, rather than kind of use this slot machine to select someone to verify the block as we do or select someone to uh, finally, you know, add the block to the chain as we do. Um, instead, they use it to select which one of the staking pools is, is going to run in which order and, and 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 various things that contribute to the schedule and, and ordering of the network. And so it's interesting the way they've applied it, but they've made, in, in with Cardano, as, just as an example, who, which uses this VRF, they've made some architectural and engineering decisions that have led them down a certain path. And so it's not that their architecture is 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 is, is bad or is wrong. It's It's great in many ways. It just... It's, it has other virtues, whereas Algorand's architecture focuses very much on the ABM, the smart contract execution, the speed and precision of that, and indeed this instant finality. And so other networks could absolutely take this open source code, change their architectures, and, and, and try to mimic this instant finality. I think that they don't for various reasons. Some of those reasons are because they enjoy the architecture they've built, but also because um, it's very hard retrospectively to go back and make such a big change to your DNA. Um, and I think when you have these systems and they're distributed and they're running all over the world, you, you'd be surprised. You know, you, you can't roll out huge changes because you'll find, oh, it breaks an app that was released two years ago or whatever. And so you got to move slow and careful uh, once you're in production, you know, once you're running, you're running in, in the real world. Um, and Algorand, I think, got it right when they built a consensus mechanism, which was able to give people that finality in one block. It just means it removes entire classes of error, Drew. Because I can tell you, when I was working on Ethereum, right, we would build apps for major banks. And they'd say, ah, oh, but this, you can have these like little rollbacks that happen sometimes as a reshuffle, right, at the tip of the chain. So it used to be block ABC, now it's like BCA, or it's maybe DEF and ABC have just evaporated. And you got to, what do you do then? The answer is you, you replay those transactions. Doesn't sound like a big deal. So if I want to send you eight, eight Ethereum, 
and I wake up tomorrow morning and it's back in my wallet because it was a reorg, I'll just send it to you again because we're friends. We're friends. But if I'm an enterprise and, and that that Ethereum is powering a contract that is settling a trade for us, that's a million dollar trade. Now I, I'm worried on a Saturday morning. And so what what banks do is that they have this intermediate like translation layer or orchestration layer, rather, I should say, that is watching the chain and is replaying events and is very much a management software. And so the great thing is when enterprises build an algorithm, they just don't need this middleware. They don't need this extra complexity. And so, yeah, you know, other chains have these problems. They can deal with it. But we don't have the problem in the first place, which is the best kind of not problem to have. <laughs> I love the way you put that. Yeah. Um, okay, we can move on to Python because this is this is a game changer. First of all, are, are there any other chains that have Python implementation on top of their chain? So this is interesting. So certainly not when we announced it at a canonical level, uh, you know, as a primary um, uh, language, none that I was aware of. I mean, there's so many blockchains, mm -hmm. right? There's like thousands of them. Maybe one of them uh, has done this, but none that are in the top 50 or top 100 or whatever. Right. Um, but there are, interestingly, so, so like as an example, Ethereum uses Solidity. It's really JavaScript. Cardano uses Plutus. It's really kind of like Haskell. Um, and these get compiled down for Ethereum to, to EVM bytecode and Cardano gets compiled, sorry, Plutus gets compiled down to um, Lambda calculus that gets interpreted by the Plutus interpreter. I can go on, you know, you can say, well, you know, Solana uses Rust and it gets compiled down to their bytecode and whatever. Um, and so no one was, was doing pure Python as the primary language. Now, we could have gone in any direction, okay? Because when we were looking at the developer tools, we looked at the language that Algorand used. And so this is, by the way, one of the problems with Algorand, right? Because that like we've got all these smart people, academics, brilliant engineers, brilliant guys, whatever, they're super smart. But they stop short of a great user experience, right? And so what we're doing now is we're changing that. No longer are we just kind of accepting, okay, this is academically beautiful, it's mathematically beautiful, okay, this is a perfect piece of software, but you know, the average person can't use it. You gotta go that extra 10% and make the product usable by everyone and so that's what algo kit is that's what we're doing with bringing python as the developer tool um john if i may you know, interrupt the, the way that you mentioned that algorand is an operating system i think is perfect because now people can take their python coding skills and build on the algorand operating system um, and not have to know algorand's language or basically how to build on blockchain it's just like an all-in-one kind of plug and play for Python coders and developers. Absolutely. And so we weren't influenced to go down Python. I've had questions, right? Because I think a lot of people get confused. Um, the Inc, you know, built the brilliant protocol, but they, the language they gave people to build on this protocol is what's called Teal. Now Teal is, it's an acronym. Okay. It's a transaction evaluation and approval language, whatever, but it's, it's what what is it if you look at it it's actually like an assembly language it's very low level it's like if you want to add two numbers you're like pop number one pop number two push together both of those regi the both those numbers on the stack pop off the the result no one writes code like that people expect to write a plus b equals c right they want it easy piece so people were using this thing but it's like hard it's hard to audit it's hard to write in it's hard to get to get correct it's it's horrible and worse you're gonna you're gonna go to market, right? You gotta hire people who know teal. Who knows teal? No one knows teal. Um, if you find people who do know teal, they're expensive because it's a niche language and the niche skills are expensive. And then you gotta maintain it. Ugh, it's a mess. So the, the ink realized this and they released Pi Teal. Now people think Pi Teal, I thought Pi Teal was Python around Teal. No. What Pi Teal was, and even now I get questions like on Twitter, like, what's the difference between Pi Teal and Python? I thought they were the same thing. No, Pi Teal was like using Python syntax. To do teal things, so you were you were writing a Python you were writing Python in a .py file, sure, but you were still doing teal. It was still like teal thing one, teal thing two. You were just writing Python code to make it do those things. So again, when you're building your business intent, when you're trying to express the when you're trying to write the app you want to write that does the thing you want to do, you are bound by this teal this this thinking in teal. Again, yuck, not going to work. So. I didn't select Python uh, with the team because we had PyTeal and Python and it's, it sounds the same where there's alliteration there. It was nothing to do with the existing languages. We could have gone with any language. The reason we, we chose, we, sorry, the, we chose uh, Python was because it is ubiquitous. It is thought, taught in universities all over the world. 
Um, it's used, of course, by the, the hot topic of the day, as I mentioned on stage, the AI, AI, AI machine learning, uh, deep neural networks, all that stuff, deep learning, all those engineers use it. And so, like, we are now about to bring out a language next month in beta, so people can use it from next month in beta, um, that is, that has been the sexiest, most learned language in the world for the last year. And so we have millions, without an understatement, probably tens of millions of people who have got off their butt, seen ChatGPT and thought, oh, I want to have a play with that, who've gone and learned the basics of Python. It's taught in schools, like I said, it's taught in universities. It's used in industry to prove to, as, as a proof of concept language, as a, a language that's very quick to prototype in. And so I think it's a perfect fit uh, for a universal inclusive language. And also it's, it's relatively cheap to hire developers in because it's it's relatively broad skill set that, that, that folks have. It's cheap to maintain. And so this is great. You know, it really is great. And we didn't just bring Python in, in a kind of a dirty way where we kind of like, I don't know, stuck some kind of front end on where the Python would just get compiled down to Teal. We have built, uh, the team at MakerX, our partners, our engineering partners have built a terrific, elegant pipeline that starts with pure Python, gives incredibly rich compiler uh, level uh, messages, warnings and errors, so it helps you with your code as you're writing it. It transforms that Python into an intermediate representation, which is very uh, similar to LLVM, a very popular uh, compiler tool chain, which is incredibly mature. And this intermediate representation gets refactored and, and, and uh, made, a, made more and more efficient by the compiler. It then gets transferred into a, a lower level intermediate representation. So it's like we're taking dough and we're kneading the dough. It's getting softer, it's getting better, it's getting more aerated, it's getting uh, more efficient, it's getting optimized. And then finally, at the bottom of, of, of the uh, of the pipeline, we spit out highly optimized, highly efficient AVM bytecode that's ready to run on Algorand. And the user, they just see the Python, they don't see any of this other stuff, okay, but it's happening. So this is a rich implementation of Python that's going to give a first class experience. And crucially, anything you can do in Teal, you can do in the Python. So it's not like we've Gone, okay, well, Python's great, but we can only do like 70% of what we used to be able to do. You can do 100% of what you could do in Teal, but you now have a, a way to do it that's easy peasy, lemon squeezy, you know? Wow, that sounds so bullish for, you know, the future development of Algorand and on top of Algorand. And there's a YouTube channel, um, Algorand Developers or something like that, that has tutorials on this. And I look forward to, you know, seeing Python on there and, and people can learn how to build on Algorand. That's great. Algorand at the, at the moment is a hub and spoke model. That means that the blocks are produced in a permissionless way um, by participation nodes or consensus nodes, but that data is propagated across the internet uh, with a hub of relays, a bit like a ring road. And so we're moving away from this relay style network to a gossip or peer to peer style network using lib peer to peer. Can you explain what the gossip network is and what's upcoming with that for Algorand and how that works into the blockchain? Absolutely true. So, um, network is very much i like to think of it like a ring road okay so we have this ring road like the road around rome okay huge ring roads very fast um and in the center we have these consensus nodes they're really called participation nodes but i like, I like to uh, call them consensus nodes because they it, it sounds uh, more uh, more simple and so you have hundreds of these consensus nodes or thousands of these consensus nodes in the center of the circle and they don't talk to each other directly instead they all send their data to the ring road and the ring road propagates the data around the entire surface of the of the circle and back into the participation nodes or the consensus nodes. So you've got consensus, data on the outside, data flows back in and, and shares it with all of the different consensus or participation nodes. So that's fine. Um, but if you think of it, it's not as decentralized as it could be. And so 
you're relying on this ring road, okay? And this ring road, if it goes down, or if just like a real road, if you have a crash or there's some problem on the ring road, um, all of a sudden, all of your data propagation stops. So wouldn't it be better if there was like roads between the consensus nodes so that we could let data flow directly between peers? And this peer-to-peer -peer idea, we say peer-to-peer, -peer, this, you know, node-to-node, consensus node-to-consensus node, consensus node data flow, this is much more decentralized. It is a, it's how Bitcoin works, okay? It's how many other crypto, crypto networks work. And so we want to be as decentralized as we can be. And there's loads of different angles for, for decentralization. There's the angle of how decentralized are your holders? Is it one big company, uh, uh, one big VC, or is it like thousands and hundreds of thousands of holders? Of course you want the latter. How decentralized is, is your, is your, um, consensus mechanism? Is it controlled by, you know, a handful of entities or is it indeed uh, truly controlled by thousands of participants, the latter being better. And indeed, finally, um, another lens with which you can look at the decentralization of, of a cryptocurrency network is, well, what about the data flows? Are they through some private network that's very fast or are they, you know, node to node? And so that's where we need to be on the latter. So we're going to change the net. We call it the network topology. We're going to change the network topology from this hub and spoke ring road thing to a peer to peer network. So you're going to have data flow between participation nodes and there's going to be like a spider web of of roads between all of these different nodes and so just like neurons in your brain right there's going to be or nerves in your brain there's going to be this like entire spaghetti network of of interactions so that data can if data can't go one way it can go the other way and it can get to where it needs to get to now crucially you might think well why didn't you do this from the start the answer is you need a, a very mature technology stack to do this in, 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 an, in an efficient way and b you want to make sure that when you're rolling something like this out that you don't adversely impact the speed of the network and so it's no good if we lose our really groovy three second block times and our instant finality we can't lose those things people uh, expect them and they should expect them. and so we're going to be launching a peer-to-peer -peer, um in 2024 i don't want to commit to dates because engineering i actually don't have the latest figures from engineering and and, and i don't think it's fair to do that but it's coming it's coming very soon um, and it's going to make the network fantastically decentralized, even at that network level. Now, there's something that would go wonderfully with this, and this is the idea of consensus incentivization. So if we're kind of deprecating the relays, or maybe a better word is, we're not relying on the relays of ring roads, right? I called it the ring road earlier, but this, this network of relays that propagate data, they're no longer necessary. You could run one if it behooves you, but you don't need to. You can go through the peer-to-peer -peer decentralized network. Wouldn't it be cool if we could make as many pathways as possible between all of these different nodes? And so the way to do that, the way to, to have high speed, high throughput, um, peer to peer connections is to encourage more people to run participation nodes or consensus nodes, as I call them, uh, in and uh, connected to each other. And so to complement the change in the network topology from a hub and spoke model to peer to peer, we're going to be also bringing a change philosophically to Algorand, we're going to start incentivizing or paying for the execution of consensus. And so this is something that was philosophically a decision that was made at the start of the network that, you know, folks are good and they will want to secure their own asset class and they will asset class with their own assets and they will want to make sure that um, they contribute to consensus. But the thing about it is, is that what you'll find is even people with with medium-sized stakes of, of Algorand or any other uh, coin don't tend to want to run the computer to, to participate in consensus because why would I bother when I can just watch YouTube instead? And so we need to give a little bit of incentivization as every other network has done from Bitcoin to Ethereum to Cardano to incentivize or make people want to run these com these computers. And so we're going to be bringing in, and we've got a white paper we're going to release soon. I haven't talked about this white paper too much, but it is coming. I made a tweet about it the other day. But what the white paper will basically show is why we're doing this, what the context is. It'll show how, how things are now. It'll explain how we're going to technically do this. So how the network is going to pay out on every block, because that's important. Because, for example, Cardano pays out every five days. It doesn't pay out every block. you got to wait five days for your pay. Um, Bitcoin, it pays on every block, but it's every 10 minutes. And so and so we're going to figure out how this works. And we have an idea. And the kernel of the idea is that we're going to pay out uh, on every block. And it's pretty elegant. Um, 
we're going to make sure that we do this in a way that doesn't in any way interfere with the security of the network because once you introduce money to a thing people come to game that thing and that's a normal thing of course it's a game theory whatever but you got to make sure this stuff is watertight as an example when i was working on cardano we noticed with consensus people realized huh i don't have to have anything in my block and i still get paid the same reward Right? The blo- no one was checking the block to see if there's anything actually in it. And so empty blocks right. propagate faster. There are less work to make for your computer. So people started making empty blocks. Now, of course, that's fine for the person getting paid. But what it's not fine for is the fact that the network now has no- nothing in the blocks because people are basically just churning out empty blocks to make the money. And so this is a small example. It's mitigated now on Cardano, but it's a small example of how you think you've got a perfect system and someone comes and finds an angle. So with this white paper, we're going to explain how we mitigate all these things. Um, any kind of gaming aspect. And we're also going to talk about the payout function, how we're going to pay out, you know, uh, Bitcoin has this kind of like step function, pays out, drops, pays out, halvenings, they call it, of course. Um, so we're going to have a more curved kind of um, continuous um, function that defines the payout. So people will know ahead of time, how much algo will I get at this point in the future? And so all these details in this paper um, and consensus incentivization um, really uh, a dramatic and powerful change for the network. It's going to increase security. It's going to increase the pathways between nodes. And it marries really well with uh, our move to a network topology, which is peer-to-peer. And so both of these things, again, this is like it, 2024 is the year of good news for Algorand. It's like lib peer-to-peer, consensus incentivization, boom, you know, Python, um, py- pure Python for algo kit, and then you know, the, the, the knockout punch with number three, which is just constantly pushing on awareness and adoption and partnerships. And so very excited about what we're going to do there. Woo, that is exciting. I am. I can't wait for that white paper. John, first of all, I want to thank you for your time because I know you're very, very busy. So thank you so much for joining D. Jenny from the blockchain. And I have one more question. <laughs> That's the coolest name for a, for a <laughs> podcast I've ever heard. Thank you. <laughs> um, so... Stacy Warden was she's the CEO of Algorand Foundation and she was on a podcast the next block a few weeks ago and she mentioned how or so, she was asked if Algorand would have like a debit card where you can build the algo token into a debit card sort of like how Starbucks has so is it possible in the future that we could actually open up our para wallet let's say have a debit card that has algo on it connected in there and pay for things at target let's say absolutely possible um the existing payments rails we call them rails but like infrastructure it are you know it's a complex system with lots of different actors in, in in the system um and so you know you can't just rock up um and just like kick them all out of their their existing uh habitat and expect to be uh, expect them to be happy so I think it's it's probably better to integrate with these systems. Um, and so we think that payments are a really, really important use case. Okay, like th- there's other things for sure, um, but payments are, ki- are one of the killer use cases. And so um, we're gonna be enhancing, enhancing Para. And I, I do think that to enhance it with the ability to, to be able to spend Either your, your, your stable coins like USDC, which we have on Algorand natively, or indeed Algo itself, um, which is a little bit more complex because, of course, you have to kind of convert it to the, the currency of the store that you're in. Um, that is a killer use case, and it's definitely technically possible. The engineering required, though, not actually so much on, on, on Para because it's, it's more front end stuff there, but integrating with that back end with the card issuers, uh, with the acquiring banks, with the settlement layer, with the visa scheme, et cetera. They are thing, things that take time. But if you watch this space, I think you will see some uh, some good news, hopefully in in, uh, in 2024 around that. Ooh, that's exciting. I love it, man, because, you know, crypto, I would love to have it be adopted so much where we can transact. We always hear the, the meme in crypto, just can I buy a coffee with my crypto, you know? I would just love for that to to happen one day. And uh, Algorand seems to have the infrastructure and the brains behind it all to get it done. Well, we, we, we like to think so. You know, I, I would just say that Algorand really is fit for purpose. It's got all of the ingredients that make a blockchain great. It's It, it hits the notes on the, the security, the scalability, the decentralization, sure. But it also hits the notes in terms of the engineering. You can rely upon the engineering. 
the cryptographic engineering uses best in class cryptography. We have, uh, you know, EDDSA for the signature scheme. We have Falcon post quantum lattice based signatures securing the history of the chain against a quantum attack. Uh, we have our own fork maintained of Lipsodium, which is like the bulletproof cryptographic library. Um, it's distributed systems engineering is second to none. Like we have some of the smartest people on planet Earth working on this, on this, on this globally distributed system. Uh, you know, I touch wood, but we've had no downtime, which is not not a lot of blockchains can say they've had no downtime in four years, right? Um, so this really is the type of network, it's the type of grown up big boy network that you can rely upon. And it needs to be that good before people can start trusting it with something as essential as their ability to pay for something at, at a store. Um, I'm very excited about not just my team, but the broader team at the, at the foundation and the Inc, engineering the protocol at the Inc, um, and at the foundation, building a network that is huge in terms of the value, but also building a network uh, that is that fosters adoption in the ecosystem, um, where where we give support to the to the applications that are building uh, on the chain. And so, whether it's the folks at the Inc who are engineering the protocol directly, um, or the folks at the foundation, we are all focused on the success of this network. And so. We have some, as I mentioned earlier, some best in class cryptography and distributed systems engineering, but also we have a really uh, strong team at the foundation and they're focused on, on so much stuff, whether it's marketing and building great relationships with people, getting the message out, getting getting uh, folks to understand the value proposition of Algorand, um, whether it's uh, building de uh, de uh, deals in biz dev, um, we have a team of people that are engaged with all of the major exchanges, all of the major platforms out there talking to the various apps and other chains, explaining to them how their app can sing on, on Algorand the way it doesn't on other chains. Um, whether it's like my team doing things like AlgoKit, which make it easier to build, test and deploy and to make Algorand a rich app store of apps um, or indeed our, our ecosystem development. So we have an, a team that's focused on the growth of the ecosystem and really pushes all the time to give love to those apps that are trying to build on the chain to give support, to get credits from AWS and to make the relationships work. And so I think we, you know, I'm only there a year and a bit, but I've seen the team grow into this like capable, passionate crew that just want to see um, Algorand be what we know it, it deserves to be. Um, so I'm excited about the future and I think it's going to be a success. Me too. Uh, this sounds so good. Sounds so great. Uh, thank you, John. You know, hey, next time we drive by and see a couple Teslas plugged in, we can say, hey, Algren uses less energy than those two cars right there getting charged. Exactly. And here's the thing. People, when they grab their Tesla, I don't have one. Um, I want one, but I don't have one. But when they when they when they when they're driving their Teslas around, they're smug. You know, you look at their little smug faces and they're like, oh, I'm, I'm driving on sunlight. And you think to yourself, a ah, half of that is what Algorand is is using for a global financial system worth billions of, are able to, you know, transact billions of dollars. Um, and that is an incredible thing and it deserves recognition. Yes. And you know what? People who watch this are going to know that now. So I, I appreciate your time, John Woods, uh, Chief Technical Officer of Algorand Foundation. Appreciate your time again and for all the education. I think we all learned something. I know I did. Um, thank you so much. Drew, thanks for having me. And folks, thanks for listening. And I look forward to coming back on the show. Thank you for watching to the very end. Please subscribe to the channel, hit the like button, drop a comment, and share the video. Follow me on X at DJNE Crypto, and please enjoy the next episode or my suggestion to the left. Thank you.